evening, everybody. Um, my name is Danielle McDonald, and I'm a professor in the Department of Marine Biology and Ecology and uh, the Associate Dean of Research here at the Rosensteel School. And I just want to welcome you who are sitting here and those at home um, watching virtually to our 2024 Sea Secret series and our fourth lecturer, Dr. Rebecca Groovy, who's going to be giving a really great talk today about the global experiment with massive marine protected areas. All right, we're just going to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Our presenting sponsor is the Bank of America, the Shepherd Broad Foundation, William J. Galway III, Cheryl Gold, KB Life Enhancement Fund, Key Biscayne Community Foundation, Joan McCon Family Foundation, Nicole and Myron Wang, St. Orr DeForest Stedman Foundation, and Southern Glazers Wine and Spirits. So thank you. All right, before we hear from Rebecca Gruby, we're going to continue our tradition of spotlighting exceptional graduate students and alumni. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Stacy Aguilera Peterson. Stacy graduated from the University of Miami in 2017 with a PhD in ecosystem science and policy, where she studied the social ecological systems of wet fish fisheries with Dr. Kenny Broad. Stacy earned a bachelor's in biology with honors and a master's in earth systems from Stanford University. She is a Harvard Kennedy School of Government Senior Executive Fellow alumna and received the 2022 Distinguished Alumni Award from the University of Miami. Stacy is the Acting Executive Director of the U.S. Global Change Research Program at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, where she also serves as the Deputy Director of Research and Acting Sixth National Climate Assessment Director. Pretty impressive, right? Yeah. She is on detail from the National Science Foundation where she leads the Ocean, Ocean Policy Office. So now let's meet Stacy in a previously recorded talk. Good evening, everyone. I am sorry I cannot join in person today. My duties have required me to stay in Washington, DC, but I am grateful to join virtually. I graduated in 2017 from the University of Miami with my PhD. Professor Amy Clement recruited me to UM. She had told me about the fantastic opportunities at Rasmus that would let me explore interdisciplinary solutions to our world's most pressing environmental issues, and I was hooked. I worked with Professor Kenny Broad, and my dissertation explored adaptive capacity and the social ecological systems of wet fish fisheries. I wanted to understand how we could facilitate resilient and sustainable fisheries, and I wanted to explore innovative and creative solutions that maintained the environmental, cultural, and economic benefits from natural resources. Studying at the University of Miami meant living among a community facing the climate crisis every day, from trying to find a new route home from campus because of sunny day flooding, to missing classes from recurring hurricanes, the students and the people of Miami are at the front line of climate change. After graduation, I was a Florida Sea Grant Canals Fellow, where I moved to DC because I wanted to dive into the policy world, hoping to find a way to enable and enact solutions for the kinds of environmental challenges that I saw firsthand during my dissertation work. Since coming to DC seven years ago, I have worked at the Science Policy Interface at the White House through two administrations and at the National Science Foundation. I have used my skills of research and scientific writing, which I honed at the University of Miami, to advise leaders, to shape US science priorities, and to represent the scientific enterprise and the United States on the international stage. I am now acting executive director for the US Global Change Research Program at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. I pinch myself every day because this is really the coolest job I could imagine. I get to work with leaders across the federal agencies to coordinate federal research and investments in understanding the forces shaping the global environment, both human and natural, and their impacts on society. The USGCRP was codified in the 1990 Global Change Research Act, 
to assist the nation and the world to understand, assess, predict, and respond to global change. The 15 federal member agencies of the USGCRP are tasked with coordinating climate change research across the government and providing that information to decision makers who are facing risk management questions under a changing climate. One of the most important ways in which we do this is through the National Climate Assessment, or NCA. We released the fifth National Climate Assessment, or NCA-5, this past November. NCA-5 is the most up-to-date and comprehensive assessment of how climate change is affecting all of us here in the United States. It was written over the last four years by 750 authors and contributors from every state in the nation, as well as Micronesia, Palau, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Americans don't need another report to tell us that climate change is real. We are seeing it and we're doing something about it. What we need is a guide to keep us moving forward, a guide to tell us what risks we're facing next and what kind of changes we can expect under different futures and what solutions can help us avoid the worst climate impacts. NCA5 is that guide. The report is built so that you can skim across the top line messages or dig deep into a topic, whatever your needs might be. We've created really beautiful and instructive figures that are easy to share, slides and handouts for educators and students. There are podcast episodes with interviews of our authors and an audiobook of the overview chapter. And for the first time ever, we'll be translating the entire assessment into Spanish. We also created an interactive atlas to create your own maps using NCA5 data to understand how climate change will affect your home and to better prepare for the future. And I'm really proud that we have included art and poetry in the NCA for the first time. The staff at USGCRP are some of the most talented and passionate people I've met, and I work with them every day to support them. At the University of Miami, I was very interested in leadership opportunities, from mentoring undergraduates to leading the research intersections with the Graduate Student Association. I have found those opportunities to practice leadership while in graduate school to be so helpful in shaping my work today as I work across teams, across disciplines and sectors and regions to provide clear, useful and usable science and knowledge to inform the government's climate, environment and nature policies, actions and initiatives. I am grateful for the opportunity to do my research at the University of Miami, and I thank the Rosensteel community for welcoming me to share a little bit about my experience before hearing about the great work of Dr. Rebecca Gruby. Thank you. I have the pleasure of introducing you to Dr. Rebecca Gruby. Dr. Gruby is the Robert K. Johnson Professor of Marine Conservation in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at the Rosensteel School and the inaugural director of the Johnson Center for Marine Conservation. Dr. Gruby is an interdisciplinary social scientist focused on marine governance, the rules, processes, politics, and actors that shape collective action and human environmental interactions in the ocean. Her goal is to identify transformations in marine governance that can advance ocean health, human well-being, and social justice. Dr. Gruby holds a Bachelor of Science in Natural Resource Conservation from the University of Florida and a PhD from the Nicholas School of the Environment at Duke University. Before moving to the University of Miami in 2023, she was an Associate Professor in the Department of Human Dimensions of Natural Resources at Colorado State University. Her commitment to ocean sustainability and coastal communities stems from growing up surfing along Florida's coasts. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rebecca Gruby to the podium. <laughs> Rebecca, welcome to Sea Secrets. Thank you so much for that kind introduction and thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm absolutely delighted to be here and have this opportunity to introduce my lab and our work on large-scale marine protected areas, and also tell you a little bit about the Rosensteel School's newest center, the Robert K. Johnson Center for Marine Conservation. However, nobody warned me that I'd have to follow Andy Mann's dazzling Sea Secrets <laughs> lecture. I don't know how many of you saw that one, but it was amazing. Um, but here we go. <laughs> So when people hear that I'm a professor of marine conservation, most of them picture me in the field in some beautiful location doing something like tagging sea turtles or taking blood samples from sharks 
Or they might picture me in the lab in a white coat cultivating baby corals or processing animal tissue. And it's true, all of that amazing kind of work is happening here at the Rosensteel School. But actually, none of the people in these photos are me because as a social scientist, you are much more likely to find me in settings like this talking to fishermen and fisherwomen and listening to their stories about their communities and their lives. Or you might find me in places like this, international meetings where global policies or treaties are negotiated about how best to protect marine biodiversity. And that's because my expertise, as Danielle pointed out, is in ocean governance which I think of as a problem-solving discipline focused on some of the biggest levers of social change, policy, rules, and collective social action. My lab, which we call the Ocean Governance Collaborative, focuses on better understanding and, when necessary, reimagining the way that people use and conserve the oceans through transformations in governance. And when many people hear the word governance, they might think of things like laws or policy or the actions of formal governments. And it's true, governance does include all of those things. But actually, it's much broader than that. We study all of the types of people and organizations who influence decisions about ocean space, including governments, but also NGOs, local and indigenous communities, funders and others. We look at the politics and, sorry, the processes, rules and social norms through which those decisions are made and implemented. We look at the power dynamics and politics that influence decision making. And of course, we pay a lot of attention to the outcomes of all of those things for people and nature. And as I always tell my students, if you care about marine conservation, then you have to care about governance because protecting marine biodiversity requires transforming the rules that we live by. This is a particularly interesting and important time to be studying governance in the oceans. Global attention to conservation in the oceans has for a very long time lagged far behind attention to conservation on land. But that's changing. Although many communities around the world have long recognized the importance and fragility of the ocean, there is now much broader growing recognition that the oceans are absolutely vital to human survival and well-being as a source of food, oxygen, medicine, for its role in climate regulation, livelihoods and economies, cultural identities, as a place for recreation, and many, many other things. And there's also a growing movement to value the oceans, not just for the services and things that it provides to people, but because the ocean has an inherent right to thrive. So I kind of like to say the oceans have arrived on the global scene and are really now a growing focus of international policymaking. And it's a growing focus for international and national and at all scales, organizations, governments, funders, and others. Which brings me to marine protected areas, or MPAs, which are arguably the dominant global co uh, conservation governance tool for marine biodiversity. For those not familiar with this term, marine protected areas, and I'll call them MPAs throughout this talk, are defined as a clearly defined geographical space recognized, dedicated, and managed through legal or other effective means to achieve the long-term conservation of nature and associated ecosystem services and cultural values. In simpler terms, they are places in the ocean where human activities are limited in order to protect nature and the benefits that come from it for people. There are diverse environmental, social, and economic motivations for establishing MPAs. They can provide a refuge for fish, corals, and other marine life. Sometimes they're established to protect particularly important habitats like spawning areas or nurseries or foraging habitats or nesting sites. And the benefits of these marine protected areas can be local to that space, but they can also spill over to areas that are outside of the protected space, like when fish populations recover within the MPA 
and then they swim outside of the boundaries where people can use them. While MPAs can benefit people, for example, by protecting culturally important areas or strengthening the health of fisheries or providing opportunities for recreation or ecotourism, they can also have negative social outcomes by restricting people's access to environments and resources that they may depend on for their food or for their livelihoods. In the early 2000s, MPAs across the world was fairly minimal. The MPAs that we had at that time were mostly small and they were mostly located in coastal and nearshore waters. And these are the areas that you see in dark blue here. Those are the MPAs. Combined in 2005, they covered less than 2% of the world's oceans. Today, about 18,000 marine protected areas cover 8.2% of the world's oceans. And again, these are the spaces you see in dark blue here. We've seen an over tenfold increase in marine protected area coverage around the world in the last 20 years alone. And if you look carefully at these maps, and maybe even not so carefully, you'll see that the biggest difference is these very large and often quite remote marine protected areas. Depending on how you define them, there are about 42 large-scale marine protected areas in the world, most of which have been established just in the last 10 years. Together, these massive marine protected areas make up 75% of the global total marine protected areas. The countries with the most coverage of large-scale MPAs by area include the US, France, the UK, Australia, the Cook Islands, and Chile. And interestingly, with the exception of Australia and the Cook Islands, these countries have achieved this by establishing large-scale marine protected areas in former colonies now governed as territories or dependencies or protectorates that are often thousands of miles away from the sovereign power. So we're really in this new era of marine conservation governance with a relatively small number of very large-scale MPAs dominating our global maps and our statistics. It's actually pretty hard to wrap your head around just how big these MPAs are. So most definitions of large-scale MPAs define them as being greater than 100,000 squared kilometers. As a point of reference, Florida's land area is about 139,000 squared kilometers. So that means the smallest large-scale marine protected areas about th are about three quarters the size of Florida, also roughly the size of Cuba. But the biggest large-scale MPAs are much, much bigger than that. So Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument in Hawaii, which is the third largest in the world, is 1.5 million squared kilometers. Okay? That's more than 10 Floridas. Okay? These massive MPAs were partly a response to increasing global conservation targets. So the first global conservation target was set in the 1990s after the famous Rio Earth Summit in 1992. At that time, the global target was set to conserve at least 10% of the world's ecological regions by 2010. We failed to reach that target in 2010, extended the deadline to 2020. We failed to reach that goal, and then we upped the ante in 2022, increasing that target to 30% by 2030. So in addition to trying to meet these global conservation targets, there were many good ecological reason, reasons that supported what has really become the race to designate the world's largest MPA. Unlike smaller coastal MPAs, larger scale MPAs can better protect biologically connected ecosystems, including significant portions of the ranges of large and migratory species, like tuna, for example, and because of their size and their extension into deeper offshore areas, they can also protect open ocean and deep sea habitats like the Marianas Trench Marine National Monument does, and that's pictured here. These types of habitats are not often included in the smaller coastal MPAs that are sort of the traditional ones. In the early movement to establish large-scale MPAs, 
there was also an assumption among some groups that they would somehow be politically easier to establish and manage because of this location in more remote areas with so-called fewer human uses or stakeholders that mattered. And because of this, some of the earlier sites were established at the highest levels of governments in political processes that failed to adequately engage relevant stakeholders, respect local and indigenous rights, and consider possible social impacts. We know from decades of social science research on the regular MPAs, the coastal, smaller scale ones, that taking into account these human dimensions was actually critical to their success, both social success and ecological success. And yet there seemed to be this assumption that these human dimensions didn't matter as much for large scale MPAs or that they could somehow be more easily ignored. But as reports of intensive social conflict began to emerge around some of the earliest large scale MPAs, I knew that there was more to the story. And that's why my colleagues and I launched the Human Dimensions of Large Scale Marine Protected Areas project in 2014 because we wanted to better understand the unique social, political, and governance challenges and opportunities of these massive MPAs. And so our motivation was quite literally to put people and social science into the conversation. Our goals were to generate new baseline knowledge about the unique and familiar human dimensions of large scale MPAs. And we also wanted to make sure that this research could, have, could make a difference, right? We wanted to share our results broadly so that it could inform policy, inform debates, inform practice, and ideally help mobilize a broader social, social science research agenda that could support this new movement. Our initial project included in-depth case studies at five diverse large-scale MPAs at a range of stages, including the longer established Marianas Trench Marine National Monument, which was in the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands and Guam. And we also studied the Phoenix Islands protected area in Kiribati. We also looked at more newly established sites, at least at the time of research, including the Palau National Marine Sanctuary, and the Rapa Nui Multiple Use Marine Protected Area in Rapa Nui, which is also known as Easter Island, Chile. And finally, we included a case study of a failed attempt to establish a large scale MPA in Bermuda because we knew that there would be as much to learn from failure as there was from success. Collectively, we spent 20 months in the field across our research team. We interviewed more than 300 people across all of our sites. And one of the first things that we did was we asked people to describe their connections to the remote spaces that were already designated as MPAs or set to become them. We filmed their responses and we shared them on our website. And I'm gonna share an example with you now. So this is David Beneventi. He's a fisherman and researcher from Saipan which is one of the 14 islands in the US Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, which is located in the Pacific Islands, or in the Pacific Ocean, just north of Guam. And in this video, which I'll play you in a moment, he talks about his connection to the three most northern islands, right here, that were included in the Marianas Trench Marine National Monument, which George W. Bush established by presidential proclamation in 2009. And these islands, again, right here on this map, are approximately 300 miles from where David lives in Saipan, which is down here. That's the nearest currently inhabited island. There are only two vessels on Saipan that are even capable of making that journey from here to here, 300 miles. And fuel alone for a single trip costs between four and $15,000. So, <laughs> arguably because of this distance, a lot of the advocacy leading up to the designation of the monument painted a picture of these islands as unspoiled marine wilderness absent of people. One publication described the area as a wild, dangerous, tantalizing region so remote that many of its wonders are yet to be quantified. Although none of the islands north of Saipan are occupied year round today, it wasn't always this way. There's actually a long history of use, occupation, and cultural connection to those islands. 
And that connection continues to this day. And let's hear about it from David. And uh, I'm from Saipan, the CNMI. Uh, my connection with the Northern Islands is uh, I am from this island. My dad's from here. And I've always heard stories of him going up there. And it, it's, uh, it was really good to be able to have the chance to, to see what he saw and uh, to be able to, to see those, those islands that everyone talks about. So when, you're, when you grow up in Saipan, everyone's like, oh, you're a good fisherman. Have you been up north? And that's, like a, that's, how you, that's a trademark of a good fisherman is someone, someone wants to take you up north so you can fish. Sadly, there was an enormous amount of conflict over the designation of the Marianas Trench Marine National Monument. But it wasn't because local people didn't support conservation there. In fact, they did. But the problem was the process that was used to designate this monument. Many local leaders in the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands perceived that the process, which was led by the White House at the time, was rushed and blind to their cultural connections to that space and insensitive to the colonial history of the islands. There was very little public consultation or transparency and this process ended up making enemies out of the very communities whose support mattered most. And unfortunately, it was this conflict and sort of long-standing local political opposition um, that became one of the most enduring uh, social outcomes of the large-scale MPA when we did our research there. Interestingly, we actually found diverse examples of social impacts in all of our study sites, all of which included very remote spaces with limited direct human uses by local population. In Palau, for example, the Council of Chiefs, which is the highest ranking chiefs in the country, used a traditional governance tool called the Bull to protect the Palau National Marine Sanctuary, which covers 80% of Palau's ocean area. This was the first time ever that the chiefs had used a bull in offshore ocean spaces. This gave the Palau National Marine Sanctuary a very important culturally um, embedded seal of approval that was critical for gaining local support for the sanctuary. And it also embedded these offshore remote ocean areas within traditional knowledge and governance systems for the very first time. This was really striking to us because it showed how large scale marine protected areas could actually create new social outcomes for populations who have never and may never actually see them or visit them. In some cases, we found that the social outcomes of large scale MPAs can be similar to those that we find in small coastal MPAs. I already talked about social conflict, which of course we see a lot of that in coastal MPAs too. Another similarity we found was an unfortunate outcome that they can sometimes fail to meet the expectations of local stakeholders. Sadly, we found that the most salient social outcome with respect to the two longest established large scale MPAs in our study, including the Phoenix Islands protected area in Kiribati and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, was a widely held perception among key stakeholders that promises and expectations of economic and social benefits that were raised by NGOs and governments during the designation process had not been fulfilled. And just like in coastal MPAs, those perceptions matter because they can affect, they matter for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons they matter is that they can affect political support for the MPAs in the long term. And we see evidence of this, unfortunately, in Kiribati, where the government announced their intention in 2021 to reopen the Phoenix Islands protected area to commercial fishing. But we also found so that the social outcomes of large-scale MPAs can be distinct from those that we're used to seeing in smaller coastal MPAs. And their distinctiveness is related to the unique ways that these large-scale MPAs tend to intersect with political priorities and policy processes at high levels, like national and international levels. So for example, government officials in the Northern Mariana Islands leveraged President Bush's interest in leaving a blue legacy right before he left office by designating this large-scale MPA there to demand policy gains on a separate issue that they had been working on for 30 years, 
which was control of their submerged lands in their three-mile coastal zone. They were the only U.S. territory where submerged lands were still controlled by the federal government, and they asked the Bush administration to return that control to the local government as a precondition for supporting the monument publicly. And the Obama, Obama administration actually made good on that commitment in 2023 and returned their submerged lands. We saw something similar in Rapa Nui, or Easter Island, which is a special territory of Chile. The large-scale MPA process there led to a new political focus on the rights of indigenous Rapa Nui people to control and manage their own marine space. And the scale at which these social impacts are felt is another unique dimension of large-scale MPAs. Palau, for example, is using their national marine sanctuary to completely reimagine their economic relationship to the ocean and in a way reclaim their own territory by reducing foreign commercial tuna fishing in their waters where the vast majority of fish and economic benefits leave Palau. Instead, Palau is leveraging their sanctuary to develop a more multifaceted blue economy grounded in ecotourism and the development of a domestic offshore fishing fleet that can supply local markets and take some of the pressure off their fragile coastal reef systems. While smaller coastal MPAs can impact particular communities, Palau's large-scale MPA, for example, <laughs> is part of a national economic development plan that will affect the economy of the entire nation. This is just not something you see in your average coastal MPA. So we shared the results of this work in all of the traditional ways, academic conferences, peer-reviewed articles, but we also invested serious time and resources in sharing our findings with MPA managers and government officials, NGOs, communities, and funders so that it could actually inform their work. So for example, we summarized our key, very practical lessons learned in reports like this one, including things like recognize that even remote, uninhabited, and seemingly unused sites have stakeholders too. They just might not be as visible, or they might be different types of stakeholders than the ones you're used to. Engage those stakeholders early in large-scale MPA planning efforts, build support by aligning goals and implementation with traditional values and customs, ensure resources are provided to deliver on promises made in conjunction with the establishment of these sites, and so on. We also teamed up with other social scientists, NGOs, and government agencies to build a broader community of practice, a network, basically, who could explicitly focus on integrating these human dimensions into the management of large-scale MPAs. In 2016, for example, we organized a global think tank on the human dimensions of large-scale MPAs, which brought together 125 people from 17 countries to develop a shared social science research agenda and practical lessons learned. And slowly but surely, things began to change. With critical leadership from NGOs, like the Big Ocean Network of large-scale MPA managers, people, management, and good governance are now being centered in large-scale MPAs. But don't take my word for it. Let's hear it from the managers themselves. Our ocean is an important ecosystem, and everybody's connected to the ocean. When you go in the ocean, you see all this life, and at the same time, seeing how delicate the oceans are, even though they're so immense and daunting, they are actually quite fragile. It's global threats that we're all facing together. Really large. It's so important to conserve it and to protect the ocean, because the cost of not doing that is so huge. If you love someone or something that you care about, you have to move people, to move mountains, to do something. Scientific evidence has shown that we have to have at least 30% protection for the ocean. So 30 by 2030 is the next campaign to try to rally people's focus and their investment to heal our oceans and to heal our environment. Look, you have to respect the nature. We came from the ocean and we have to make sure that we use it sustainably for our kids and future generations to come. Well, the bottom line is nature doesn't need management. People need management. And so the only way to do that is to build relationships between people, to share lessons learned, to improve marine management and governance around the world. 
the ocean connects us all. And regardless of where we're at, the challenges are very similar. So we need to work together to maximize our impact and be more successful. At this event, we have more than 20 managers representing 17 different countries, where in essence represents the foundation of large-scale marine protection. Unlike a long, long ago where an island problem was just an island problem, a resource area problem can be a global problem. Facing all the challenges coming in terms of global conservation, we have to do it together. We have to share experiences, and from that we can save time, energy, resources, and all the things that are normally lacking when we are working in conservation. Entonces, toda esta experiencia eh, reunido acá, eh, voy con con la mochila lleno de de materiales para trabajar allá. I've learned a lot from my colleagues who have come long distances to come to Hawaii, and it will result in changes in what we do and how well we do it. I take a lot of lessons back home, especially about community-led conservation. So just incorporating all of these traditional and ancestral elements into conservation, I think, are really important. Fifteen years ago or so, conservation planning was a very top-down process. Areas that are created in a top-down process can not work because of the lack of local support. And now, there are several sites that are trying to create marine protected areas, but from uh, bottom-up processes, where communities are going to the government to ask please protect our waters. That's a huge change and it's something that we should try to promote in every single area. I see a lot of people who try to put more native knowledge inside conservation management. Indigenous people have been in connection with the resources for so many years and the knowledge has been passed from generation to generation. So they know exactly what is going on, where, so if you harness that knowledge, then any policies or strategies you make you become more inclusive for everybody. And indigenous people, they are part of the solution rather than part of the problems. It's finding our core common values together in order for us to move forward. The vision for the future is one where we have healthy seas, where we have food security, fish are abundant, a stable climate so that our reefs survive. It's the whole food web that we're able, as humans, to be supportive versus destructive. I see in the future healthy oceans and also healthy people. And bringing everybody to the table can lead us to this place that we want to get to. My experiences here after this week give me hope. That's why bringing people together is the most important thing. If we can heal people, if we can heal each other, then healing the planet is doable. Anything is achievable with the right mindset and the right vision and the right commitment. And so it's absolutely achievable if we can do it together. So we've come a long way in thinking about how to integrate human dimensions into this management of large-scale MPAs, but our work in many ways is still just beginning. We still need to protect another 21.81% of the oceans to reach the 30% goal. And equally important, we need to ensure that the MPAs that we do have are actually effectively and equitably managed in practice. And if you look at the language of our current global conservation target, you'll see a few other things that have evolved alongside our percentages, right? The target is very explicit about the need for effective and equitable management that respects the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities. And so that's why now we're trying to focus on implementation. Okay, the, in 2021, the director of the Big Ocean Network asked our team to help establish a baseline of where we stand in terms of implementing large-scale MPAs at a global scale. So we developed a pilot survey that we distributed to large-scale MPA sites around the world. We ended up collecting data from 11 of those sites. And what we found didn't entirely surprise us, given that most large-scale MPAs are still relatively young. All of those sites reported being underfunded relative to their needs. About half of the sites represented in our survey were severely underfunded, either reporting no dedicated budget at all or a budget that was inadequate to fulfill basic management fun functions. Relatedly, no site reported that staff capacity was adequate for their management needs. Most reported that they had either no staff assigned to support the site explicitly or that staff capacity was inadequate even for the most critical management activities. And that's in part because of just how massive the task is. 
This is the map of a, the Palau Ma National Marine Sanctuary. The small green dots you see right here are Palau's landmass, where its population of roughly 18,000 people live. Everything in light blue is the Palau National Marine Sanctuary, which is again 80% of their total ocean area, or 477,000 squared kilometers. That's three and a half Floridas. This is the only patrol boat that is capable of policing their offshore waters. And this is my friend and collaborator, King Sam, who is the director of the Palau National Marine Sanctuary. And on the wall surrounding his desk are the list of management goals and activities that he and his tiny staff are responsible for. I nearly had a panic attack looking, just looking at this. And Palau is not alone. Survey respondents from eight of our 11 sites reported significant deficiencies in surveillance and enforcement capacity, which of course is tied to deficiencies in budget and staffs. But there are bright spots too. A paper that was published in 2022 in Science found that Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument in Hawaii, which is the world's largest no fishing zone and arguably one of the best resourced and governed MPAs in the world, has found that large mobile fish like tuna are spilling over the boundaries of the no take zone, leading fishermen to catch more fish near the edges of the MPA. This is proof of concept that large scale MPAs can work for people in nature when they are managed well. Our new Johnson Center for Marine Conservation at the Rosensteel School will be partnering with the University of Guelph and the Big Ocean Network to continue tracking progress and priorities for large scale MPAs at a global scale so that funders, NGOs, and policymakers have the information that they need to support their implementation and to understand their dynamic needs and priorities over time. We actually updated that initial survey with managers at a workshop in 2022, and we launched our second global survey just a couple of months ago. Our goal is to collect data from every single large-scale MPA in the world until at least 2030. And this is exactly the kind of applied conservation science that is at the heart of our new center, which was launched just recently, December of 2023, with a generous gift from the Robert K. Johnson Foundation. Our vision for the center is grounded in an understanding that science alone can't solve our environmental problems. We recognize that marine conservation is fundamentally a social and political process that requires interdisciplinary knowledge about the complex relationships among ocean health and human well-being and it requires meaningful engagement with communities, practitioners, and decision makers to ensure that that knowledge can inform policy and practice. And so that's why our mission is to foster innovative connections between science and society to inspire and, trans and inform transformative marine conservation in Florida and around the world. Our goals are to produce actionable science and knowledge, catalyze non-traditional partnerships, develop innovative education and outreach programs, provide expertise and thought leadership, support science communication, and throughout all of our work, broaden participation in marine conservation. All of our initiatives sit at this intersection of our overlapping priorities in research, education, and outreach. So in addition to our work with large-scale MPAs, we have the Shark Research and Conservation Program, led by Dr. Catherine McDonald, which brings school-age children on the water to participate in conservation-relevant shark research. The Rescue a Reef program, led by Dr. Diego Lehrman, builds community and coral resilience through public engagement, education, and citizen science focused on coral reef restoration in our own backyard. We have the Ocean Philanthropy Research Initiative, which is leveraging social science to help donors most effectively and equitably make grants to improve conservation in the oceans. And our brand new Ocean Science an art initiative is building collaborations between artists and scientists to push the boundaries of how we understand, experience, and communicate about marine conservation. We're expanding WAVES, which is formerly known as Ocean Kids, and is a civic engagement program led by Dr. Maria Cardellano, who's right here in the audience, um, that provides experiential STEM education and activities for children from underserved Miami communities. And finally, we'll be expanding our work in the area of marine mammal conservation with the recent hire of Dr. Vanessa Mincer, who's a conservation ecologist who, focus, who focuses on the human activities on small cetaceans like dolphins. And we look forward to welcoming Dr. Mincer to the U this fall. 
So, of course, we're just getting started as we continue to build our new center. We welcome your ideas, your partnership, your support, and your friendship. Please check out our brand new website, just launched yesterday, um, and follow us on social media to learn more about our work. Thank you so much. Rebecca, thank you so much for sharing your incredible work with us in marine conservation and marine protected areas. Now I'd like to introduce Jennifer Dillon, who will host our question and answer session. Hi, everyone. I wanted to uh, say every time I say the same thing, thank you so much for that. It was great. I was very interested in learning about uh, MPAs, and I'm looking forward to hearing everybody's questions here. Um, before we move on to that, I just wanted to say, if you would like to support us, our students here at the Rosensteel School, um, you could contact me, Jennifer Dillon. I, I will be happy to help you, for, you know, set up a scholarship or whatever for our students to bring students here who might not be able to afford an education like ours to come to such a great university to be able to go out into the world and do the kind of work that you do. It's so important. Um, I just wanted to say that before we do this. Um, we're also going to go ahead and do our questions. As everybody here knows, what we're going to do is we're going to send, uh, send the microphones up into the audience. Please raise your hand, ask your question, and then hand the microphone back to our students here that are with us tonight. Thank you. If you have a question, you can go ahead and raise your hand. Thank you very much for that great presentation. I have a question about metrics, uh, meaning how do you measure results of establishing the large MPAs compared to the small ones? One of the things you mentioned was, I think you call it spillover, meaning all the fish that goes out of it, that's probably one of them. What other metrics are you collecting to assess the effectiveness of that uh, policy, I guess? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. So. I, I am not studying the effects of MPAs on fisheries. That's another study, and um, amazing fisheries biologists and ecologists are doing that work. But there's what our study did was actually create a framework for measuring the social outcomes of MPAs. And so we highlighted things like you need to think about the economic impacts. You need to think about the cultural impacts. You need to think about the political impacts. Um, and so we highlighted the different types of impacts that are part of this human dimension suite and sort of raise the profile that yes, even though these sites are remote, they may not be used with less visible stakeholders, all of those same types of impacts are still being felt. They just might be felt by different populations at different scales and in different ways. And so there's many different methodologies, social science techniques to study those. Um, but what we did was set up the framework and sort of raise the profile of these issues. And now we're seeing you know, new studies coming out that are actually broadening the type of work that's being done to measure the effectiveness and outcomes on many dimensions, including the human dimensions. Thank you for that question. Uh, what are some of the criteria that you use to establish what are areas that are most uh, beneficial to, to make a uh, MPA versus other? In that's other words, a, why Palau versus, let's say, Bermuda? That's a really, really good question. And actually, what was very interesting about the early large-scale MPA movement is that there wasn't a lot of science informing those decisions about where the MPAs should be and what the boundaries would look like. They were largely political decisions. And there were many different motivations behind where, they, where those boundaries were drawn. And in places like Palau, actually, the boundaries have been redrawn and they're still in the process of negotiating, redrawing those boundaries again. Um, but in the early days of the large scale pain movement, there was very little either social or natural science that was informing where the lines got drawn on the map. It was largely a political decision and political process for many of these, which was interesting. <laughs> I, I thank you very much, and I, and I think it's wonderful that you're looking at these social and societal impacts, but I'm wondering if you came across issues having to do with 
you mentioned politics, but I'm thinking more in terms of ocean mining and industrial mm -hmm. and governmental uh, concerns. Um, sure. I'm thinking particularly of New Zealand where our daughter has worked with the blue whales mm -hmm. in the Taranaki Bight where they were gonna do iron ore mining. Yep. And she got them to stop, but it was a struggle. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure that that interferes with where you have the marine protected areas as well. Yeah, I mean, certainly there in the in the Cook Islands uh, Marine Park, there are, um, as I understand it, multiple use zones where they're still open potentially to mining. And so there, there are different types of MPAs with different levels of protection. Um, and not all of them mean no activity. So there's a range of, of levels of protection that can happen. Um, interestingly, in the Marianas Trench Marine National Monument, for a significant part of that large-scale MPA, it's actually only the seafloor that's protected. So in the Marianas Trench, the water column, you can do whatever you want, but it's the seafloor that's protected because they were really interested in that very special deep sea habitat with um, vents, like hydrothermal vents and the unique ecosystems that thrive and live there. So I think it's a very important question and it really should be part of the discussion in sort of 3D and how we think about protection of MPAs, not just line on a map, but what part of the water column and seafloor get included? Great question. Um, my question, this is fantastic and really eye-opening, is really around the funding for enforcement. Like, there's so many different ways that you're exactly defining what an MPA is or an LMPA, but what are the clever ways that they're being funded, attacks on the fish that come out of those areas? Like, how mm -hmm. Well, that poor, that poor guy in that picture. Yeah, it's, a, it's another great question. So, I mean, as, as I mentioned, mo almost all, all of the sites were underfunded relative their, to their needs. But, of course, there's a scale. Some are worse off than others. Um, we are seeing some creative um, partnerships with NGOs and private philanthropy. Um, so, in Palau, for example, there was a partnership with the Pew Charitable Trust, and they have a, like a program called Eyes on the Seas, where they were supporting Palau's monitoring and surveillance and enforcement using satellite technology paired with vessel monitoring data coming from ships, and that's actually contributed to them apprehending those Vietnamese uh, fishing boats that I showed you that they're burning. So, it was this partnership with an NGO. Um, so, there's many. I think creative and different ways to, to fund them, but we're, we're all still underfunded relative to the needs because these spaces are just so huge. But there's new, and there's emerging technologies, I think, that are going to kind of change the game. My question was also about the funding of it, but I wanted to add, just to drill down a little bit more on that. Does the U.S. government have like a funding position? I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> I'm looking for the um, Does it have like a funding? Does it the U.S. government fund it? Like, is it a line item on the you know on a budget or in some major appropriation bill? Because we could afford to, to do Hawaii Palau. I don't know how they would do it. And I also wanted to ask about the integration, and particularly when you're talking about, um, you know, the indigenous people, and, and and many of them are, you know, the the government there. What is there? Have they passed? Is there a legal structure that's in place to mm -hmm. protect them about, to protect or to enforce the, to the extent that you can enforce people staying out of the protected area. So. Yes, I mean, the, so sites in the U.S. and Australia um, are some of the better funded sites because, you know, ours are, they're funded through the National Marine Sanctuaries Program, some of them, and then also the National Marine Monuments Program. They get funding through NOAA and our agencies. So, you know, these are the better funded sites, and we can see that as evidence in Papahanaumokuakea, a well-funded site that's well-governed, well-implemented, and we're starting to see results, right? It's not the case everywhere. Um, there are sites that have no funding at all, like literally none. Um, so there, it really ranges and, you know, there are, we need to get creative about funding opportunities. One of my other research agendas is on ocean philanthropy and what we've seen over the last uh, decade is doubling of 
ocean philanthropy. So there are many new large foundations getting into the game of ocean conservation. And so we're seeing some new sources of philanthropic resources for um, funding marine conservation. The Blue Nature Alliance is an example of, it's a group, a consortium of NGOs and funders that are supporting implementation of large scale MPAs. Um, and on your other question on indigenous communities, um, Yes, at least in Palau, I'll just use that as an example, the legal framework supports and recognizes traditional law. Um, and the Palau National Marine Sanctuary is also embedded in the formal legal structure of Palau. So it's got a twofer. <laughs> so we're almost at the end here, but we have two more questions after this one and the one up there. We're going we're, we're gonna to stop. What was the underlying cause of the failure of the MPA at uh, Bermuda? Hmm. That's a long story. <laughs> Let's just go with opposition, <laughs> local opposition, concerns about economics and concerns about loss of sovereignty given the roles of foreign NGOs and funders in the large scale MPA process. It's a long story, <laughs> but a good question. I want to begin by saying thank you for your good work. Thank and you. the other piece is you said something about new technologies being a game changer. Could you just highlight some of that for us? Yeah, I mean, one of the, the one that I would highlight is, is uh, the work of like Eyes on the Sea, where we're combining kind of big data from multiple sources, like satellites, technology, vessel monitoring systems, oceanographic currents in new ways to be able to detect, and this isn't me, it's not we, it's the collective we, the ocean conservation community, this isn't part of my work, but in combining big data and multiple data sources in new ways to be able to detect what looks like suspicious activity that can then be alerted to ground teams that can ground truth it. And so if you're interested, the eyes on the seas, you can Google that and learn more about it. It's really interesting work. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Thanks for inspiring us. So tonight's presentation will be available in the coming days on our YouTube channel and on Facebook. Please join us on the 9th of April for the season's fifth and last lecture. It will be Brian Soden presenting uh, Climate Engineering, a Bold Idea Whose Time Has Come. Thank you all. Good night.